Hello and welcome to a special bonus episode of the Weekly Stuff Podcast with Jonathan Lack and Sean Chapman. We are here as we do every month now to talk about classic Doctor Who. Yes. We might have to give this like monthly show a different name, but because we're, go- we're going forth. And uh-huh. if, if any episode solidified that we're doing more of this, yeah. it's this fucking one. Uh-huh. This month on the show, we are moving ahead to the third Doctor. We are. John Pertwee John, himself. John Pertwee himself. We are talking about the final story of his second season, The Damons. Or the demons. Yeah, depending on how you want to pronounce that thing. Which the, the episode, the story is not sure how it wants to pronounce yes, it Yes, it goes back and forth on it. Um, we have, in the last two months, talked about a first Doctor story, a second Doctor story. The goal of this is that if you have not gone into classic Doctor Who before, one, you should. Yeah. And two, each month we're going to pick an episode from a different Doctor and uh, talk about it to help ease you into the show. And Sean, who has seen every episode of Classic Who, yes. has been picking them. Sean, uh, other than just it's fucking awesome... Why did we pick the Damons? Well, the real, actual, true reason is just that I wanted to rewatch it, which is <laughs> the real, actual, true reason for kind of all of the ones I'm picking. But other than that, it is also my my criteria has not necessarily just been like pick the best story, although a lot of these stories are like some of the best stories from each mm-hmm. run. It is also I want to pick the one that I think exemplifies sort of like the the specific traits and characteristics of each era of Doctor Who. So that's why we did like the real historical story of the Aztecs for the first Doctor. We did, you know, the fun, crazy sort of like sci-fi stuff with Tomb of the Cybermen. And for the third Doctor, who has one of the most singular, uh, I think, eras on the show, I picked the demons because it has... Uh, one, my like the biggest prerequisite for me in picking a third Doctor story was it had to have the Master in it. We had to do one that had Roger Delgado. Like, there's lots of good third Doctor stories that don't have the Master, yeah. but especially because like this year on New Who we had all the Master stuff, and it is so defining of his era. You've got to start there. Yes, and I just and and you will talk a bit about how you have gotten into a third yeah. Doctor hole, but before you did that, you had never seen a story with Roger Delgado, so that no, was another side of like I wanted to make sure you had that. But I also had to make sure we got an episode that had, you know, the Brigadier. It had Sergeant Benson. Sergeant Benton. This one even has Captain Mike Yates, who is sort of here and there sometimes in, in, in the Third Doctor era. But it's got the whole cast. It's a big, crazy Joe adventure. Grant. Yes, it has Joe, Joe Grant as the companion, who's sort of like the most, you know, Third Doctor companion. She was with him for the longest. And then it's just a big, crazy, fun adventure on Earth with just a lot of ridiculous action and and stupid I mean, monsters that are great monsters. It's it's a very prototypical Third Doctor series in like the or story in the skeleton of it. Uh huh. But in the execution, it's a very typical Third Doctor story on fucking crack. It's yeah. It's I mean, I had kind of forgotten just how action packed it is, and and that's the most appropriate because the Third Doctor is nothing if not a man of action. Yeah! Exactly. <laughs> you know, he's got to use that Venusian karate. <laughs> I really, you know... So do you want to talk about how I've been getting into this? Yeah, let's let's talk about yeah that. because yeah. Be- Your story everyone knows. You've seen all of it. Yes, I've time. seen all of it. So that's... Yeah, we've been over that plenty. But you had only seen, like, weird bits and pieces of classic Doctor Who up yeah. till now. I'd seen something from every Doctor. Yeah. And most of the Doctors I'd gotten to the point where I'd seen more than one thing. The third Doctor, though, like... When I went through them all the first time years ago on an old podcast we did, he was the one that made the biggest impression on me. And I went back, like, with the 50th anniversary special, we were going to have a multi-doctor story, so I watched the three doctors, and I'm like, this John Pertwee guy is awesome. And I'd seen several of his stories, and then you and I were doing this classic Doctor Who podcast project, and I really wanted to start watching more stories in order. The thing is, with the first and second doctor, that's a difficult thing to do. Yeah, definitely. Um, Especially the second doctor, because it's like... Even with Tomb of the Cybermen, if you want to just pick up and do the next one, you can't. Yeah, it's only his last season that you can do it for almost all of the stories you can just yeah. watch through. But other than that, yeah, it's yeah. very hard. And, you know, you can do reconstructions and stuff. I just wanted to be able to, like, easily kind of settle in and watch some stories. Yeah. And it's like, well, the Third Doctor era, it's actually very similar kind of to, like... I've been rewatching the Moffat era in pop preparation for the end of his run. It's the same kind of thing where it was a very, like, fresh start. Um, yeah. Where everything kind of gets reset at the beginning. And, I mean, with this one, literally, you're in color for the first time. Yeah. And so I just started with Spearhead from Space, which I'd also seen in as one of my favorites. And went on from there. And I've been enjoying it so immensely. I got through his first season, season seven. And I thought, oh, man, you've got Spirit from Space, Doctor Who and the Silurians, Inferno. It cannot get better than this. And then his next season, season eight, all of the stories have Roger Delgado as the master. Yeah. He is, just spoil my opinion on this, 
without even a question the best Doctor Who villain. Oh, yes. Like, yeah. uh-huh. it's not even a contest. And that's not putting anyone else down. It's just he's in a different league. Yeah. And you've got, you know, the entire cast in place. They start to, I think, loosen up and experiment with what a third Doctor story was. And they're just terrific. And I keep watching these amazing stories. Ones that I'd heard a lot about, like, you know, Inferno. And ones I hadn't heard a lot about, like Colony in Space. But that's also, I think, a map. An under- unheralded Doctor Who masterpiece, sure. Colony in Space. And, like, these are all great. I'm like, I am so excited to see the Damons because this is the one Sean picked of all these great stories. I wonder, is it going to, like, disappoint? No. Nope. Nope. The Damons... Is fucking insane. And I love that the, the finales for both his first and second seasons are Inferno, which is fucking insane. Oh, yeah. And then the Damons, which is really insane. Yep. And it's this whole occult celebration with the Master where the Doctor gets almost burned alive in a maypole. And it's wonderful and weird. And, man, I just... The third Doctor era is, like, other than the, uh, the 12th Doctor run that we're, I guess, still in nearing the yeah. end of... I would say easily the best run of Doctor Who I've seen, and I do want to continue it on through the fourth Doctor and see all that, because that's the other, obviously, era that people will say is the best part of Doctor Who. Yeah. But, the, I mean, it's just, it's some of the best sci-fi storytelling I've ever seen. Every story is varying shades of great, I think. And there is something that I think we can talk about with the Damons, because I think the Damons leverages this really well to having a stable supporting cast. And yeah. it's not just the Doctor having a couple friends in the TARDIS. It's an, it, it feels like a, a TV show cast. Like, there are, in that season, six regulars. You have the yeah. Doctor, the Master, Joe, the Brigadier, Sergeant uh, Benton, Benton, and Captain Mike Yates. And they're pretty much all there in every story. Colony in Space is a little different. We still have the Master and Joe and the Doctor and stuff. And there is something about that that's, I think, really interesting that Doctor Who has never really done in a different era. And I, I think there was also something to... And I think that Damon's actually a great example of this. Being stuck on Earth, it was frustrating for the Doctor, and it was frustrating for Terrence Dix, he'll talk about it, but God, it made them get so creative. Yeah. Like, I do think creative limitations sometimes help, and I think they got so creative, and one of those is like, well, fuck, what do we do for the next story? Evil demons in the English countryside. Okay, yeah. let's take that to the nth degree. <laughs> And they definitely did. So before we dive into the demons as a whole, let's like let's back up and like talk more about that third Doctor era, yeah. broadly speaking. Because as you said earlier, there are like this was a fresh start in a way that Doctor Who had not had up to this point. Because that I mean the the William Hartnell to Patrick Troughton transition literally happens in the middle of a season. I mean, like what you talk about with like what a season was in right like the first Doctor the second Doctor era is a little weird, but still like it just sort of like moved right through that. And here, um, when the set, when the third Doctor comes on, there was a huge shift in the show in a lot of different ways. One of like the most obvious ones, if you're watching them all back to back to back, is that it's in color. But and, and then also obviously now that John Pertwee's playing the Doctor. But there's a lot of other stuff that is also really important to sort of talk about here. And it's one of the first like early pivot points that you see like Doctor Who becoming more like like what we think and understand Doctor Who to be now. Like, if you look at, like, the first and second Doctor era, there's obviously a lot of the stuff is recognizably Doctor Who, but there are the things of, like, the role of the Doctor in a story, the role of companions. That stuff was kind of different back then compared to, like, the modern Doctor Who model, which is, like, the Doctor is the leading man, he's an action sort of lead character, and then the, you know, the companion is always this sort of, like, modern contemporary female British character that has a very specific function in most of the plots. And that was something that it took a while for the show to develop to that point. And the Third Doctor era is a big shift more in that direction. So some of the stuff that happened was, um, it's 1970 now, and so it's a lot of the Third Doctor stories are very psychedelic in ways that are really fun. And The Demons is a good example of this. It's also very heavily uh, influenced by James Bond, and that's very clear in a lot of ways. Um, in fact, The Demons actually uses some footage from a James Bond from, movie. From Russia with Love. Yeah, for the explosion of a helicopter, which is uh, amazing. Um, but the other big thing that happened and to me is maybe the most significant change that happened with the shifting to the third doctor that is important in how we talk about this stuff is that for the first and second doctor era, 
this, the production staff behind the scenes was very uh, transitory. Like they were on there for m- like a year at most and then moved on. Like, like Verity Lambert was basically only there for the first season. Verity Lambert being the woman who created Doctor Who and she was the producer for the first season. And then she left very quickly. And that was kind of how it was as they churned through people behind the scenes pretty quickly in classic Doctor Who. So it's hard to look at that first and second Doctor era and like Doctor Who in the 60s and talk about it the way that we talk about modern Doctor Who, which is like, you know, you talk about Russell T. Davis and you talk about Stephen Moffat as showrunners and how they have eras on the show. That's harder for me to do with the first and second Doctor, but it is not hard to do with the third Doctor because the third Doctor has sort of solidifies these two really important creative positions that define the show going forward, which are positions that generally are held for three to five years by most of the people um, that, that fulfill these positions. And that's the lead producer, which for the third doctor is Barry Letts. And that's the script editor, which for the third doctor is Terrence Dix. And both of them serve those roles for the entirety of the third doctor's run. And Terrence Dix actually was script editor a little bit before the third doctor uh, came on the scene. And that's, I think one of the big interesting shifts that happens with the third doctor is that Barry Letts in particular, you can feel his sort of like creative energy Mm -hmm. in the show all the way through the third doctor's run. I think he's the defining like him and John Pertwee, obviously like for like the front facing, like on screen element. But in terms of the behind the scenes, getting the scripts together, doing the casting, all that stuff, that's like Barry Letts driving the show forward and making these top level decisions about having like this largest supporting cast about like what kinds of stories we're going to tell on Earth, about introducing all these like psychedelic elements and introducing action and stuff. It's a lot of his influence there. And so if you're you're looking at like the showrunner, that position didn't exist technically back then. It was in the way that like it, it officially exists now. But that is Barry Letts was the showrunner for the Third Doctor era, and he also happened to be the co-writer. Of the demons Mm -hmm. um, with another gentleman, I can never remember his name, uh, Robert Sloman, who Barry Letts and Robert Sloman wrote a number of different stories in the Third Doctor era together. But and then it, Barry Letts also was a director well, on a and, number of different Third Doctor stories. And well. what's their pen name on this? Guy Leopold, right? Uh, yes, Guy. Yeah, yeah, Guy Leopold. You have a lot of pen names in this era of Doctor Who. Yes, that, that, that goes for it. I think it was partially there was a like sort of element in place of where for there was some like policy with the BBC that they did not want production staff to also write, and I think there were like okay. credits issues with that. So that's why you have a lot of weird uh, well, pseudonym stuff. I love going this on. whole explanation because. It really is uh, helpful to understand the Third Doctor run, which is, especially I think if you've seen a good amount of First and Second Doctor stories, remarkably consistent. And I don't just mean qualitatively, though it is, but it does feel like the same show, story to story, you know? Whereas the First and Second Doctor, and and sometimes to their credit, it's a wonderful thing about them, but there's a lot of very different flavors of stories. Absolutely, yeah. Like, they move through those styles very quickly. Yeah. Um, But, no, I mean, the Third Doctor run, uh, it feels very modern. And, like, the Damons... Frankly, it's crazier than you would ever get on Modern Who, but there's a lot of elements of it that you just you forget you're watching Doctor Who from 1970. It yeah. feels like... I mean, there's more action in this than a lot of modern Doctor Who stories, and that's saying something. Yeah. Uh, another thing that I just thought of, that in case people are just like, this is your first introduction to classic Doctor Who, it is important to, if you don't know and haven't researched the context of why this is all set on Earth and all that stuff. Right. Uh, basically, what happens at the end of the second Doctor's run, at the end of the War Games, which is his last story, is the Doctor um, contacts the Time Lords, although they have not been called the Time Lords yet still. I think they have now in where we are with the third Doctor, but at that point, we didn't know what the Time Lords were. Um, then we still haven't heard Gallifrey. That word has still not been spoken yet. Um, and so then the second Doctor contacts the Time Lords. We find out about that element of it and that he ran away from them. And because the only way he can solve this problem is by having the Time Lords be involved. But obviously the Doctor stole his TARDIS and ran away uh, from this unnamed home planet. And the Time Lords are not still not very happy about that. Are not happy about how he goes and interferes with all this stuff. And, and they're dicks. And, and they're massive fucking pricks. Yes, that is, <laughs> that is very true. So they, uh, one, they give, um, like, great, brilliant, maybe arguably one of, if not the best companion ever, Jamie has a very sad ending for people who don't know, is that Jamie is put, Jamie and then Zoe, the other companion at the time, are put back in their time zones and only remember their first adventure with the Doctor and the rest of their memories are wiped. Mm. So, so they, they forget 
Um, I think that eventually that's like retconned in Big Finish stuff or something, but in the original canonical TV show, right. they forget all their adventures with the Doctor, and then as part as a punishment, they forcibly change the Doctor, because we still also, regeneration is not a term that is in use yet, so it's funny to think of all the stuff that people understand about like what Doctor Who is and all the terminology, and it took like... A decade plus for most of that stuff to actually like be official on the show, so they forcibly change him into John Pertwee and dump him onto Earth. And then at the beginning of Spearhead from Space, uh, the TARDIS doors open up on Earth, and John Pertwee just falls out of it, and it's all in color now. And we're off to the fucking races, exactly. Just like let's start with one of the best Doctor Who stories of all time, and then see if we can one up it. Yeah, yeah, it's it's great. So. So yeah, that's and he's he's working with Unit and Brigadier Lethbridge Stewart, who had appeared in several Second Doctor stories. Yeah. Benton had as well. Yes, um, he's yeah. in. I think I'd seen Benton in the Invasion, right? He's in. That uh, one. Yes, he's in the Invasion. I yeah. think that's his first story. I love Sergeant Benton. He's yes, he's guy. very good. He has a lot of really good moments in the Demons. Yeah. Yeah, oh, he sure does. And and yeah, so you have this kind of regular cast around him. His first, the Third Doctor's first season companion was a woman named Liz Shaw, played by Carolyn John. Yeah, and I like Liz as a companion. Me I too. think she's probably a little underserved by the show. Uh, although Inferno, she is fantastic. In yes, it, because she's mostly not playing Liz Shaw in that one, or she's playing evil Liz Shaw. Yes, um, and anyway, that's that's great. That's where you have the Brigadier with an eye patch, and it's wonderful. Um, but then you get to the the, but even like the Liz, like they never quite figured out exactly how to use her on the show. In part because she is introduced as like Unit's scientist. Like, yeah. if it weren't for the Doctor, she would be doing his job, and it's just. Like they never really figured out how to have two ki- like today we would think of Liz almost like a Clara or something who can yeah. really go toe to toe with the Doctor, but they didn't really write it that way back then. Yeah, it's also important to note that while you have this larger supporting cast structure for like the companion companion right. role, this is the first time we're moving to this like one companion. Uh, yeah. Thing that for the first Doctor and second Doctor era, it was basically you always had a group of at least two, if not three, companions all together. Doctor Road with a posse, exactly. And now, so it's like, and it's one of the interesting things about that third Doctor era is that it sort of smooths that transition by having this larger supporting cast until you get to the fourth Doctor era, which yeah. is mostly just one companion the whole time. Yep. And then in the in his in his second season, season eight, is when you get Joe Grant, yeah, uh, Katie Manning, who is uh, in my. Uh, it, always in the running is for my favorite companion. Sure, yeah, one of the top for me. She's very fun. She's, I, you know what? I actually think it would be useful. Usually, we kind of talk about the characters later in the story. Okay. The third Doctor run is so cast centric, and I actually think to talk about the Damons, we have to have some context for the characters. Yeah. Let's talk about some of these characters. Okay. We also talk about the Master who was introduced this season. Yes. And and everything Roger Delgado brings to the table. But let's talk about some of these characters. So Joe Grant, really quick, just because we were talking about that. Like, yeah. why does Joe Grant work as a companion so well? And to me, I mean, it's a couple different things. One, Joe Grant, to me, is the funniest companion. She makes me laugh all the time. And it's not that they give her jokes. It's just that Katie Manning is really funny. I think she's just yeah. a naturally funny person. And her interactions with the Doctor, like, it's a really interesting thing. Because you could, on paper, it sounds regressive what they did, which is that the Doctor's companion was too smart, so we gave him a woman who's not a scientist to hang out with. It doesn't play like that to me. It plays like that, like, Joe Grant, no, she is not the genius that, like, Liz Shaw was, but in some ways she is more what the Doctor needed, which is a friend. Yeah. And she is, like, just a really good, loyal friend to him, and she has this really unique, youthful look on the world. Like, my favorite recurring companion tick is that Joe Grant will break out and recite 60 psychedelic song lyrics. She does it at the beginning of the Damons, yeah. where she says, it is the dawning of the age of Aquarius, Doctor. And in the three Doctors, you have my favorite Doctor Who joke of all time, which is that the second Doctor is explaining, I am he and he is me, and we are all together. Goo 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 I get it, yeah. Doctor. Best Doctor Who line ever. And it's just things like that. She's very funny. But I also think like she facilitates a lot of interesting storytelling, um, both with her relationship with the Doctor, in that they're just... It's very father-daughter, kind yeah. of, you know? And they're very good friends in that way. But also, she is a really interesting, active presence in that she kind of, I think, also helps to kind of foster what we would get in a lot of these younger female companions of she has a certain go get itness to go, like help solve the mystery. Yeah. And she's just, she's great. I love Joe Grant. And she's very, like, it's one of those things of she feels so 70s. Like, she's yes. so of that, like, early 70s. Her costumes era. are amazing. Yeah. I mean, the hair in, for all the characters in the third Doctor era is just astounding. All the hairstyles, two thumbs up. She's got this, like, jacket in the Damons 
this like faux, it must be like faux leather kind of thing she's wearing with like these pants that kind of match. It's just an amazing outfit. Yeah, she's got the best costumes. Yeah, she's she's a lot of fun because also like Katie Manning is an insane person. Like she's just if you've ever seen an interview with her, she just seems like she's bouncing off the walls in in a way that is very appropriate for the Joe Grant character. She lives Joe Grant uh, absolutely, and there's just. You know, the most important thing about any companion-doctor relationship is this thing that I think goes beyond talent. It's not something you can plan for. It's something you just have to let happen organically, and that's chemistry. Yeah. And, you know, like I'm watching in my modern Doctor Who rewatch the period where uh, Jenna Coleman is with Matt Smith, and then she's with Peter Capaldi. And Jenna Coleman's a great actress. Matt Smith is a great actor. I don't think they have the kind of chemistry requisite of a great relationship, Doctor and Companion. And then she's with Peter Capaldi, and I'm like, yes, it snaps yeah. into place. And it's like, this is that, you know, Liz Shaw and the Doctor were interesting together. Joe Grant and the Doctor together are like an all-time team-up. Yeah. You know? And I love that. Yeah, I mean, she's with the show for a long time. She's with them for three years. Three full seasons, yeah. yeah. The first year is Liz Shaw, and then the last year is Sarah Jane. That whole middle chunk is all Joe Grant all the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and gives the Doctor, like, it's nice that the third Doctor gets multiple companions, but there is also this one in the middle that's, like, all his. And, and yeah, and, and is the shit. one of, like, if you think about, if I think about, like, the third Doctor, like, right. Joe Grant is the companion that I think of more yeah. than anyone else. So, what other character? But, I mean, let's talk about some of the unit figures. Yes. Because Joe Grant, of course, her role is, I, I don't know what job exactly she got with unit. I assume yeah. the Brigadier put an ad out, like, you have to work with a crotchety old man. Who's annoying See, me. Because I was hoping that since you just watched this whole season that you would remember how the fuck she gets a job at Unit. Because I actually don't. No, it's, it's been a it's, long time. It's really I've great. In Terror, Terror of the Autons, which is a phenomenal story, in the first episode, basically, the Doctor is like, you know, again, trying to repair his TARDIS, which he does a lot in yeah. these seasons. And the Brigadier brings in this, like... Or no, Joe Grant just comes into the room and starts doing stuff right. for him. And it's a phenomenal first scene. Because the Doctor, like, is just thinks this young girl has come in to annoy him. And she's like, no, I'm your new assistant. He's like, I don't need an assistant. Because the third Doctor is a fucking snob. Yeah. And anyway, they have this back and forth. And then the Brigadier comes in and says, you do need an assistant, Doctor. Just because Liz Shaw went back to university because she thought you only needed someone to hold your screwdriver, you do need an assistant. It's like this great exchange. And then Joe Grant kind of endears herself to the Doctor by being plucky. Right. Yeah. But they don't address how someone so utterly unqualified is working for no. the United Nations Intelligence Tax, tax Again, Force. like, the Brigadier and the, the Brigadier is the next character I'd kind of like to yeah. talk about. And the yeah, Brigadier right. and the Doctor have such this well-defined relationship where... They love each other, but they're always bickering. Yeah. And I think it's just like the Brigadier was probably annoyed at the Doctor one day, and it's like, I, he needs an assistant, I really don't care who it is. Yeah, just like, take the top of the pile. Yeah. It's like, here you go. Yep. Like, Joe Grant doesn't even seem to know quite how she landed the job. She's just, she's very helpful. Yeah. But yeah, the Brigadier. Yeah, so let's talk about you, the Brig. What can you say about Brigadier lethbridge Stewart other than... Here, I'll give a little anecdote. Okay. So I've now watched two full seasons of this. I follow, I already loved this character, the Brigadier, because you, if you like throw a dart at a second or third Doctor's story, and you will probably get a Brigadier story. Yeah, especially like if you're if you're calling like the good ones in particular yeah. from like the whole history of Doctor Who, yeah. even for which he appears for every Doctor except for the first Doctor. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you will probably find a... So I had seen a lot of the Brigadier, always loved him. As I've said before, he is like if you took Graham Chapman from Monty Python playing the general and just had it be a serious dramatic performance, that's yeah. the Brigadier. And it's it, Nicholas Courtney is so awesome in it. Uh, but I, you know, now I really know the character and his relationship with the Doctor. And I got to that scene in The Wedding of River Song, the modern Doctor oh, story. Yeah. It's the worst Stephen Moffat episode by a country mile, but it has one scene where Nicholas Courtney had died in real life, and the doctor calls the retirement home where the brigadier is and says he wants to go hang out with his friend, and it's like the nurse says, well, he passed away in the night, he you know, was always talking about you, and he, every time he had a drink, he always poured an extra scotch hoping you'd come around. And I was tearing up, and, and my brother, who has not seen Classic, was looking over at me like, what, what's going on? I'm like, this is fucking tragic. Yeah. <laughs> this is so tragic. And it is because he is, he looms larger kind of than any one companion. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, he again, he's stuck with the show like all the way through to the seventh Doctor. I think he doesn't have a sixth Doctor story other than Big Finish re uh, rectified that with one of their audio dramas. Right. But like he's there like Battlefield is one of my favorite seventh Doctor oh, stories. So That's the one that we watched mm -hmm. um, forever ago on an old podcast as my favorite seventh Doctor story at the time. And yeah, like he has this presence on the show that even when the show was 
going wayward, like the Fifth Doctor story, um, Modern Undead, which is where uh, the Brigadier shows up for the Fifth Doctor, like, he just centers that show again when the show had totally lost itself in a way that's like, Nicholas Courtney and that character have such a power and are so perfect for the show, and particularly that relationship with the Doctor, of where they are in some ways, like the complete opposite and yet they both drive each other so perfectly if you're talking about like on-screen chemistry somehow nicholas courtney has perfect on-screen chemistry with every single doctor he played with he does absolutely but of course john Pertwee's the one he did it the most with yeah which means they just get to play more shadings naturally yeah. you know and you get these like in the Damons, you don't get a lot of the bickering because they're in a very hot tense scenario where they have to put aside any differences but like you know you often get they will get very mad at each other or mostly the brigadier takes it in stride and the doctor is kind of a jerk to him yeah but you always get this sense that like i think their like love and respect for each other runs very deep kind of like an old married couple is the yeah. way they play it but it's great i mean he lends this spine to the show in this period that i think is invaluable uh, you know I, I joked on the regular podcast that the third doctor's greatest enemy it wasn't the Master, it wasn't the Daleks, it was bureaucracy. Yeah. And it's part of that is represented by the Brigadier. And it's not the Brigadier's fault, but like the Brigadier's the guy who has to take the Doctor's insane ideas and make them like work. And it's yeah. actually something I... In modern Unit stories, you don't get this because Unit is just like in awe of the Doctor. And I wish they'd kind of dial that back a little bit. Yeah. Because part of the fun of a Unit story is that they have to work in the real world. And the Doctor knows more than they do, but he doesn't know how to interact with this world. And that's part of the fun of, of them brushing up against each other. Yeah. The other element that's so vital for the Brigadier to play, and it's one of the reasons why I think Nicholas Courtney is so vital for the show, is that... He can make the most absurd, outlandish, ridiculous fucking plot seem so grounded and real because the Brigadier just approaches every single scenario with the like, this sardonic attitude of like, okay, yep, like he just, everything he encounters that is, would seemingly be beyond your comprehension and would send any other person like basically insane, he's just like... I guess this is how the world is, and just accepts it into his worldview, and then moves on from there. And the way he's just able to accept something and move with it, even if it's, again, it's like fucking the master summoning the devil, basically. He's just like, okay, how do we to fix it then? It's why he's the right guy for unit. Exactly. Because, and you get the feeling, like, maybe if he was in a regular, like, military brigade, he'd be the weird one in the group. But because he's here, it's like he adds normalcy to the craziness. Yeah. And, and no one else could do that job because no one else would have the like, intellectual stamina to, to do these crazy things. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's the wonderful thing about him, the, of the many wonderful yeah. things. And on top of that, Nicholas Courtney just also has some of the best like deadpan delivery <sighs> humor. In particular, there's a couple of really great moments in The Demons, but I really love early on... Um, when like the shit has gone crazy but he doesn't know about it yet and he's calling from his like hotel room or something to find out like where everybody is and you, and you only hear his side of the conversation he just says they took my helicopter <laughs> he's great I mean I said like it's a dramatic performance but Nicholas Courtney knows when it's funny yes yeah. he's, he's in on the joke and what a just what a great actor and character and everything yeah. man yeah. And then you have the unit supporting cast, like Sergeant Benton and Captain Mike Yates. Yeah. Benton, to me, like, you know, you know him better because he's been in more stories and stuff. And he's just, he's always there. He's very much like a mini brigadier in some ways. And he's just a good, simple guy. Yeah, it, it's, I like him because he just, like, I feel like Sergeant Benton's role is, like, he just, he's kind of like the muscle in some ways, which you very much see that in this story. But he also... I think he's able to be more kind of on the doctor's level and on Joe Grant's level with a lot of things where the brigadier has to be above them because he's the commanding officer. And Sergeant Benton kind of gets to go along with them and have fun yeah. with them in some ways. And yeah, he's just, he's not a like eccentric, crazy character or something. He doesn't get like a, he, like, you know, a lot of big Sergeant Benton stories, but he's this nice rock, like steadfast presence in the show. It's like any good TV cast. You're happy when your favorite characters show up. And yeah. Benton is one of them, you know? Yeah. And Captain Mike Gates, he, he's introduced uh, along with Joe Grant and the Master in Terror of the Autons. Yeah. And, you know, he's basically kind of like a male counterpoint to Joe Grant in that he's the younger, like, unit figure. Um, and I don't know him as well yet, and I know he has some big story stuff, like, later in the run. Yeah, um, near the end. He's yeah. got some stuff. But he's an interesting character, too. I, I like him as kind of the more, like, 
vanilla white guy, you know, yeah. kind of standard soldier character. I mean, he's very much, he feels like this sort of, like, middle, like, upper middle class, because he's a captain, so he's, like, technically an officer, but he's so young that it feels like he hasn't really, he doesn't have, like, the wealth of experience, whereas, like, Sergeant Benton feels like, Sergeant Benton's been through the shit. We know he's been through the shit because we've watched the invasion. He's been through the shit, let me tell you. Uh, but yeah, well, Sergeant Benton always wasn't always so accepting of everything. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. So it's like Sergeant Benton's sort of like been there and like worked up to be a sergeant, and then like it feels like you know not anything against Captain Mike Gates, but it feels like he more yeah. it's just like you know he grew up and went to like some academy or something that like allowed him to just become an officer, and, it, and then he joined unit. And it always feels, and I did look this up, and it's it was a plan at some point. Like there we were, they were always like you know flirting with Mike Gates and Joe Grant. Getting romantic, yeah, it never happens. No, it doesn't. But it always feels like there's something there that they never explore. Yeah, like I had kind of forgotten about that until I was watching the demons again. I was like, oh wait, right, this was totally going to be a thing, and then they just decided not to do it. Even though yeah. I think it would have been a slightly more graceful way to transition Joe Grant out than than the the weird classic Doctor Who thing of introduce a male character in the middle of a story that then at the end of the story the companion's like, well, I fall in love with this dude, so I'm just going to stay here. It's like what? That was that was fast. All of you people, that was fast. My own granddaughter. <laughs> All right, um, Roger Delgado. Yes, the mass. and this will transition us into the episode, and we'll find a place to talk about the wonders of John Pertwee later. Maybe yeah. when we get to the Maypole scene. But <laughs> sure. but Roger Delgado's master, Sean. Here's where I want to start. Okay, yeah. You have been telling me for years about Roger Delgado's master. Yep. And it's not that I didn't believe it; it's that I couldn't conceive of it because I hadn't seen it. And Roger Delgado's master is simply put one of the best villains of screen history. It's like if you, easily if you open up a dictionary and turn to the word villain, it should just be the a picture of Roger Delgado as the master in lieu of words, because it's like that dude has the perfect look. It is so to the most minute detail. Everything about that dude, villain. Like, it's just the hair, the beard, the sort of scowling face, the, like, sunken in eyes and this heavy brow that casts shadow over his eyes. And, like, they give him the perfect clothes. All the, like, he's always wearing black, except for in this episode he used to wear <laughs> his amazing, like, lavish red satanic robes here and there, which are so great. And he's just, the voice is perfect, the attitude is perfect like 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 every single like the the exact ratio of black hair in the beard to white hairs in the beard like it's fucking perfect no, in you, a way it is unbelievable you couldn't like sit down and imagine and animate a better like physical villain it's like if you fucking found a magic genie and made a wish the genie couldn't make something <laughs> as good as Roger fucking Delgado no and you know it's so much of it for me, like in what I've seen, is also that they devoted a whole season to this is the season where the master will be the antagonist in every story. Yeah. To, to one degree or another. It's like some he's the full driving force, some less so. But like, that's a great decision. It means you really get to know him, you get to know his relationship with the doctor, all these things. And that's one of the things that like really got to me watching these in context. And I would I would stress if you enjoyed the demons, if you loved this episode, and if you didn't, who are you? Yeah. Um Watch this season in full. It's just a great fucking season of TV. And there is like this light continuity through it of the master keeps fucking with shit. And I love it. And, you know, one of the things that also I think is so real about it is that Roger Delgado and John Pertwee were friends in real life. Good yeah. friends. It was actually a, a component in John Pertwee quitting the show later on was Delgado died in a car crash and just kind of couldn't imagine doing the show without him, which I totally get when yeah. you watch this. And that's the great thing is that you can see... Like when, you know, Stephen Moffat wrote all the stuff this year with the Master and the Doctor and how they were friends once, that's to me him watching the Roger Delgado, John Pertwee stuff and saying, these guys were totally friends once. Yeah. Because that's what you see is this friendship that has curdled into rivalry, like more than anything else. I don't think it's like this, you know, the Doctor is like this god figure, like, I must defeat you because you are wrong. It's because... I'm better than you. Uh, and there's this like petty rivalry between the two of them. But you get this sense of these actors, again, just loving each other in all of these scenes. And they're constantly coming up against the line of like, why don't we throw all this stupid stuff aside and just go be friends again? And they never do, which is the yeah. sad part. Except it's not sad because then you get the satanic ritual. It's yeah. amazing. And yeah, and it's just you always get this sense of, like you said, that they used to be friends in some way. And that like... Th 
that like the master's kind of having fun and he's oh, playing yeah. like he does i think he legitimately does want to conquer the earth and rule over the petty humans but really it's just like he if the doctor wasn't there he wouldn't be on earth he wouldn't be sticking around like he wouldn't keep on playing around here if he didn't know that the doctor was also there because he wants to have fun and he comes up with all these ridiculous schemes and is like trying to you know brainwash people that is part of the thing for me about this master is that he's not sanctimoniously evil he's evil for the fun of it yeah and i don't even know if you call it evil sometimes he's just fucking with people it's just you get the sense of like he doesn't value life in the way that the doctor does no. but like you know it's just a different perspective on things for Time Lord. Like, there's a really defining scene in Colony in Space where the Master's plan involves he wants this space laser that can destroy galaxies. Yep. Because, of course. Very good. And, and the Master is, you know, trying to say, like, Doctor, come with me. We could rule and save galaxies together. And it's actually a really interesting, I think, dramatic moment between the two of them. And the Doctor's response is, I don't want to rule the stars. I want to see them. And it's like, that to me is one of the defining Master-Doctor moments where I think what the Master kind of wants more than anything is to either keep fighting with the Doctor or for the Doctor to come around and have evil fun with him. Yeah. You know, like he wants a friend in villainy. And it's just all of it. There are so many shadings to this performance. He has so much fun with it. And I think there's something really critical about the show never taking itself too seriously with the Master. Again, like, he's kind of a crappy villain. He's uh, Every Master plan is he teams up with some alien race he thinks he can control. He cannot. Things fall apart and it's up to the Doctor to patch things back together yeah. for the Master as much as Earth. Yeah. The other thing I really love about this era of the Master character is also that, like, I feel like because this is when they had to come up with the name and the gimmick and all that stuff, I love his whole thing of that he just tries to, psycho like, psychically dominate people. And so he's just always just, like, staring into their eyes and saying, you will obey me. And it's just like that, like, he's got, the, like, he wants to be the master of people. He wants to have power and authority over them. And there's a certain vulnerability to that I love, where yeah. you see this kind of, again, petty weakness beneath it all, which I think Roger Delgado has a lot of fun playing. Yeah. It's so, it's so wonderful. He's just, he's a great engine for stories. In this season, and I presume beyond. I'm interested to see the, his, his final set of stories we get later on as I move through this era of the show. God, when you get to the fucking The Sea Devils, the fucking sword fight is so good. <laughs> it's so fucking... Like, when you're talking about that the, the Doctor and the Master are actually just playing around and having fun, like, that is the scene I think of as the sword fight scene. You're going to fucking love it. It's so good. Like, honestly, if I were, you know, a Doctor Who showrunner today... And I was planning on bringing back the Master again one day. I would look to this model and not have it be like a one-off finale here and there. I'd make him a more regular part of the show. Yeah. Which is part of how Michelle Gomez worked so well this last season. Is She was a pretty regular presence as Missy throughout the season. And I think... Yeah. No surprise, she became a much more interesting character through that run. Yeah, I think it's something that it's harder to sell the character when it's too sporadic. Because I think yeah. that's even something that uh, classic Doctor Who ran into when it had to move on. Is you eventually, you know, they recast the Master a couple of times and then sort of settled on Anthony Ainley playing the role um, at the end of the Fourth Doctor's run. And then he plays it through to the end, uh, you know, like all the way through to the last story. He's in survival with Sylvester McCoy. It's like Anthony Ainley is good, but it's also like one... The Roger Delgado performance was so iconic that he couldn't kind of like break out from that. But then also, if you're only having the character appear once a season or once every couple of seasons, he just kind of turns too much into a generic villain and loses that nuance of that relationship with the Doctor that Roger Delgado and John Perry just had so naturally, just immediately. Because it's like, and here's how I want to transition into the Damons is, you know, you tell people about the Master today, and they're like, all right, you know, he's got his own TARDIS, he's got a laser screwdriver, he tries to conquer Earth, he's got these crazy plans, or she now, you yeah. know, because we got a male and a female version, and I'd say, but did you know the Master once shrank people? Uh -huh. He once tried to possess the minds of prisoners? He uh, once tried to make a deal with an alien race to, like, take over the Earth? He once basically became a bureaucrat in space to try to fuck over some space miners? And... In the culmination of this, he once tried to summon Satan himself to a small English countryside town. Did you know that about the Master? Oh, I did, because I watched all of these. Fuck, Sean. Yes. The Daemons. Yes, let's, let's get into it. It is five perfect episodes of Doctor Who. Yes, it is one of the like very few Doctor Who stories that is five episodes long, and I always th forget. I always think it's a six episode one, and then like then I looked at it as like, oh wait, no, this is five episodes. That's a weird episode count, but it's a good episode count for this one. <laughs> 
Because it's a weird episode. It very much is. It's yes. a weird story. It's and it it does take some time ramping up. Like episodes one and two is where you get like episode one is all the stuff that the master is doing weird incantations in this town, and the doctor there's a there's a witch out there who's like trying to warn everyone, and the doctor picks up on this and thinks something's wrong. And then in episode two, like this these forces were released, but we're not sure what they are. And then at the end, this gargoyle comes to life, and then we're off to the races where episodes three, four, and five. You keep thinking it can't top itself. You know, episode three has the car chase that ends with a helicopter exploding. Yeah. Episode four has the Maypole scene. And then episode five has Azal. Yes. Like, you just think they can't one-up themselves, and they keep doing it, and then drop the mic. It's- and it's just like a succession of larger and larger explosions until you have what is maybe the biggest explosion on screen in the history of Doctor Who. <laughs> Where a church just blows up. The whole fucking church blows up. And I was reading about this. They did that to a miniature, obviously. But it looked so convincing, and it does when you watch it now, that like people watching it at home were freaked out and wrote the BBC like, you blew up a church, you animals. Yeah, like that seems a bit excessive for this children's program. Like it is, they do, you know, the cursory thing that the demons are actually aliens, or as John Pertwee says, demons from the planet Deimos. Yeah. Which is why I called it the Demons, because I just love that line delivery. Because as with everything Pertwee says, he says it so confidently. Yeah, he just, like, because it's something that the Doctor learned, like, 500 years ago. So it's like, yeah, he's the demon from the planet Demos. How do you guys not know that? But other than that, there's not a whole lot of references to them being aliens. This is a story about occult satanic rituals. Yeah. And I love that this got on the air on the BBC in 1971. Uh-huh. That's yes. crazy. Yeah, it's very insane. So let's go to like the beginning of the story because I think I really like episode one. I really like how they do the slow build up yeah. and the slow setup of because I think they also there's a couple of things that they set up um, um Barry Letts and Robert Sloman in the script. At the very beginning, one of the best things they set up is that uh <laughs> The Doctor and Joe are having this conversation where, where Joe is, says, as you said earlier, it's like, but it is the Age of Aquarius. <laughs> and so that like starts this whole conversation with the Doctor about how Joe believes in magic and the supernatural. And the Doctor, obviously, I mean, particularly the third Doctor, is he's a man of science, okay? Yeah. Like, he's not the mysticism, blah, whatever. Like, I'm all about the hard science, Joe Grant. And to prove this, he has uh, wired up a remote thing for Bessie. With a like remote control, so that Bessie, his his bright yellow co- like vintage car, is driving around and can honk, and they have a lot of fun showing this car drive around, and 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 the doctor uses that to try to trick Joe because Joe, you know, thinks it's probably all magic. It's like, haha, no, it's just a remote control. Yes. Oh, I mean, we haven't talked about the greatest third Doctor character yet, Bessie. Yeah. Uh-huh. Which I mean, it. One of my favorite just gags in all of Doctor Who is that the Doctor agrees to work with Unit on the condition they get him a car. Yeah. He doesn't want money. He just wants a, I mean, wants space to work on his TARDIS, but he just wants a sick-ass car because in Spearhead from Space, he steals a hospital director's car and the Brigadier makes him give it back. Yeah. And so he gets this shitty yellow convertible, which becomes like his de facto best friend. Yes, that has the license plate who won that is very good. Oh, it's great. And Bessie is like a pre- actually surprisingly integral part of many stories. Yes. But like, none so, like more here than... they set it oh, they set up this remote control thing that that is paid off two times later yes. in this five part serial. It's great. I mean, and actually I was kind of surprised by that because often the Bessie stuff are kind of one off gags. Which you totally understand. Yeah. But like then, and I thought that's what it was in episode one here. Like I thought the thematic thing was more about magic versus science is what we were going to get. But no, Bessie being able to remote control drive herself is all over this thing, making me really want John Pertwee in a Herbie movie. <laughs> because he'd sure. be great. Not going to happen, but it'd be cool. Yes. Because he's dead. But you know. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, so it's it's a really good functional scene because it serves two purposes. It serves up this like you know supernatural versus science thing, and then it also sets up um, the Doctor being able to remote control Bessie, which is at the, spoilers at the very end of the demons is the final hand that he plays to capture the Master, who is then the Master is captured for like several stories because he doesn't come back till the Sea Devils. Yeah, it's like he is in prison after this. Story. Where I understand they have him on a water prison, a la Magneto, or something. Basically, yeah. Which is great. I mean, you gotta you gotta deal with the Master in a special way. You can't just throw yeah. him in normal prison. <laughs> But yes, I oh god, the end of this story is so good. Yes, but we, we'll get there. Oh yeah. So then after that opening scene, I think the maybe like the main thing I want to talk about with episode one that is like really remarkable. This is something that it stays remarkable for the rest of the show, but it was something I had kind of forgotten about. Is the demons is for the vast majority of this story filmed on location in a small English village and is filmed outside. 
um, which is really rare for Doctor Who, for classic Doctor Who to have that much outside like location filming. The most episodes have a couple, although there are plenty that are just all on studio. And you do get a little more in the third Doctor because he's on Earth. Yeah. But even then, it's obviously not every story. Yeah, but like in particular, um, what really stood out to me is like, you almost never see this in classic Doctor Who, is they fucking film at night on location. Like, they go out to this fucking Karen burial, because the whole setup of the plot is that there's this weird, like, hankery professor professor dude who has some, there's some, like, ancient Karen that he wants to dig up that is actually the, like, tomb of these demon creatures, but he obviously doesn't know that. And you have this witch, uh, Miss Hawthorne, who's also protesting this and doesn't want them to dig up this Karen but the whole thing is framed as this BBC Three, which at the time BBC Three did not exist. It was supposed to be set in the near future. That's really funny because BBC Three, Doctor Who spinoffs have aired on BBC Three. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So at the time they made up a BBC Three because it was supposed to take place in the near future. And if you want to have like a go down a really fun bizarre rabbit hole, look up like unit dating conspiracy on like the Doctor Who Wikipedia, and you'll spend a lot of time being like, well, this story was because of this detail. This story must have been set. In the 80s but that doesn't make sense for all these other reasons anyway so like but it's all set up as this bbc3 report of of this sort of thing of like oh they're going to open up this burial karen thing at midnight on like may day or whatever um and i literally like just that setup and a lot of like the incidental characters because that's something that once you're out of episode one like once the karen opens up and and the, the story really starts off none of that stuff appears again like even they never even really address the fact that that weird professor dude like dies and once that thing opens up um but i really like all the weird little characters and the weird relationships and interactions on this bbc3 like set and that the framing of the story is really unique and it allows them to be like they fucking are filming at night on location like and not in a studio you, like literally i can't think of off the top of my head another doctor who story that did that like it's just never fucking happened right uh, and yeah, every episode in this serial does have something different and special about it. I was saying the first two are slower, and I just mean that by they're setting up the plot. Yeah. But you do get all these wonderful things. But there are things that carry through. Like, I love that countryside location. They just found such cool places to film. I love the general aesthetic of everything. Like, it very... I mean, it actually reminds me a lot of the other 70s BBC show I know well, which is Monty Python. Right. And they love shooting in these kind of places because they thought people there were weird, you know? And yeah. so they would do that. And so you get a lot of that. Miss Hawthorne, who totally feels like a character out of Monty Python. Yeah. She carries through all five, and she's just a, a great one-off guest star, yeah. you know? Uh, in addition, and that's one of the things is that the third Doctor stories also have, I think, an unusually high quotient of like good guest star characters. Yeah. In addition to this great main cast you have, so it's just a very rich ensemble you're always watching. But yeah, that BBC Three thing is interesting because it adds this kind of immediacy to it, and also makes the end of episode one one of the better, I think, Doctor Who serial cliffhangers. In that it feels like there's some real consequences to it. Yeah, because most Doctor Who serial cliffhangers are. The doctor, like, turns around, something's about to kill him, and then, like, five seconds later, it's, oh, thank God, it wasn't what I thought it was, you know? Right. Which is fine. It's how they're told. It's fun. But, like, this one is, the doctor goes to try to stop the professor. The thing blows sky high, just kills the professor. We never hear from him again. The doctor is frozen, you know, yeah. like an icicle, and this whole town is, like, now has a heat shield around it. It is apocalyptic. <laughs> Appropriately so, because so, yes. it also like because it does set the mood very well. The the this this serial has a very particularly early on has this very omeny kind of feeling to oh, it. Oh, really? Oh, the the sets are so much like the omen. Yeah, and, and then it, like down to um, when we get the great reveal of that the master is has replaced this vicar and <laughs> is wearing you know this vicar outfit that already like basically looks like what the master wears anyways. But I love, I, it's just, it's got this really good sense of just, again, like, tension building and of, like, s establishing this setting and this mood that then, like, carries through for the whole thing. And I think they do a very good job in this story of making the events feel, like, big and epic and apocalyptic in the appropriate way with, like, a very limited budget and very limited resources in a way that I was... Like, have, again, I have not actually, I had not rewatched this story since I watched it the first time, which is like almost 10 years ago now. And so my memory of some of the stuff was, was kind of fuzzy. I was really impressed rewatching it. Like, fuck, they like did such a good job with the resources at the time of giving this impression of the fucking, like this town is just falling apart. Like, like it is going insane, is being taken over basically by the devil. You have this whole weird cult that is led by the master. You have this heat shield that has now surrounded the town. And there's just weird shit going on all the time with like 
just whenever uh, Azal, the demon, appears, just like the screen goes white and red and orange and everything goes shaking and people are falling all over the place. It's like it feels big and dramatic in a way that a lot of classic Doctor Who doesn't really to me. This, frankly, feels like the kind of story that modern Who would have to reject for being too ambitious. Because yeah. if you did it on a modern scale, you'd want everything to be bigger and scarier and you might say it's too expensive. And it's like there was just something in the imagination here. It was like, no, we'll do it no matter what it takes. And they found ways to be very creative in showing all this stuff. And so much of it is more about, you know, sort of mood and performance than it is any one big special effect they can pull off. But you get so sucked into it. Like, you forget you're watching, you know, a BBC show from the 70s shot on tape and which survives in... You know, this is something we can actually talk about with the third Doctor. His first two seasons, the surviving versions of the episodes are kind of in this weird state. Yeah. Where they did, those were wiped as well. The original color tapes and what they were restored from were black and white tapes with like a very variety of different sources, but like things that would like give the color information that restoration teams would go in and kind of like a colorization process, but it's restoring the actual color, not giving fake color. Yeah. So they're a little rough looking, but yeah, yeah, it just all melts away. Even like, you know, there is one, you know, wonderfully crappy effect in these episodes, oh, yeah. which is Bach, the gargoyle, who is very clearly a guy in a crappy rubber suit. Yeah. But it doesn't, none of it matters because it's just, you have this heat shield and things are bursting into flames and there's, the world is shaking and all of those are pretty simple effects for them to do. But man, you just get this sense of like, this is bigger than what the doctor normally deals with, especially at this point, you yeah. know? And it's something that, it, again, like thinking about, you know, like, stepping stones to, like, becoming what we think of as, like, modern Doctor Who. I mean, this whole season is the first time um, they ever sort of experimented with this idea of, like, oh, let's have, like, a kind of recurring element to this one whole season, which is something that classic Doctor Who never stuck with, but does every now and then when it sort of felt like it. Um, so, like, having the mask to recur every single story makes this season feel really special. But then also, I think the demons being the last story, like, has this proper like season finale kind of feel to it where like things have gotten ratcheted up to this ridiculous extent like it feels like the earth like legitimately like the entire earth feels like it is legitimately at threat here from us all and and it does conclude with the capture of the master like yeah. it does have it's not exactly obviously the way that you would do it today but it is like the rudimentary skeleton of what you think of as a season finale story oh absolutely um you know, and everyone dances around a maypole. Exactly. Because yes. that's, I am sad that in three seasons, Peter Capaldi has not danced around a maypole. Stephen Moffat, how could you? I mean, you just can't, I mean, they can't do it again because they can't top the original. Yes, no, you're right. But it's, yeah, I mean, it, it's apocalyptic, it's big. You, and again, the like action set pieces they do, like the, when we get to the third, I mean, I don't know when we're going to talk about this, but the third episode has that car chase it is legitimately a super impressive action scene. It is well shot. It is well choreographed. It's, you know, well conceived more than anything else. But it's exciting where the Dodger's being chased down by this helicopter. He's heading towards a heat shield that will kill him and Joe. Joe and us don't really know what his plan is. And his plan is to drive that helicopter into the heat shield and, like, swing away at the last moment like he's, uh, like he's John Rambo or something. Yeah. It's amazing. Yes. I mean, it's just something that the whole, this whole story is very action-packed in a way that was more common for the Third Doctor era because I think John Pridley White, White, White likes to be able to fight things and likes to drive around on screen and stuff. What's his karate called? Vesuvian karate? Uh, yes. 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 Yeah. Well, no, it's, it's Venusian. Like Venusian. From, from okay. Venus. Okay. Yes. I, <laughs> it's yes. so great. So he doesn't actually use it in this story, but he has a lot of other standout uh, fight scenes. But the big... The thing that I loved about the sort of like the big sequence of fight scenes that sort of recurs a couple of times over the story is Sergeant Benton gets to kick some oh. fucking ass in this story. Like, is it, he gets one like almost every single episode, even if he doesn't win the fight, he gets like a good like meaty fight scene that I was very excited by. It's like, yeah, Sergeant Benton. <laughs> Kick that weird cultist dude's ass. Well, he kind of teams up with Miss Hawthorne over the yeah. course of the story, and they're kind of, they have their little corner of the story, and they keep running into shit, and he just fights it. And he's, I, and like, you know, Captain Yates feels like the guy who kind of wants attention from his superiors and, yeah. like, to get noticed. Sergeant Benton's like, he'll just take the punches as they come, and he won't even mention it to anyone. Yeah. I mean, he has this great move that he pulls in that first fight scene where the, the cultist kind of comes up behind him with a gun drawn and Sergeant Benton, you know, has his back to him and puts his hands up. And then he, because, because the actor's really tall, he just like kicks his leg back and like from behind just kicks from like the bottom of his leg, kicks the gun out of the dude's hand, then turns around and punches him in the face and starts this fight. 
that is, like, for the time, legitimately, I think, pretty decent fight choreography. If you compare this with something of, like, Star Trek the Original Series, which would have been a little bit earlier, but also Star Trek the Original Series had way more budget and time <laughs> yes. uh, than the classic Doctor Who did. Like, I was pretty impressed by the, the action feats of Sergeant Ben, and was like, yeah, this is, I, I can get behind this. Like, this is a decent little fight scene. Yeah, I, I, you know, there's kind of nothing better than late 60s, early 70s TV sci-fi fight choreography. Yeah. There's just something great about it. But this is like that cheesy fight choreography done unusually well. Yeah, there's no, like, weird, awkward, like, double-fisted hits to the back. They're like, that would not hurt anybody. Like, you could do that <laughs> to a five-year-old child, and they'd be like, why are you patting me on the back? And it's like, this looks like, the, you know, that weird cultist dude straight up just got punched in the face. Yeah. And I could appreciate that. Where do we want to go with the story next? Um, another sequence that I really like, it's sort of like we're kind of talking talking about a lot of the stuff in episode two is near the beginning of episode two you have this scene where uh sergeant Fenton and mike yates are in the helicopter together flying over trying to figure out what has happened because they were watching like a football game or something on tv and instead of watching the broadcast of the cairn being opened and so when they so they flip to the channel right when the cairn thing opens up and see like the doctor collapse to the ground and like well we should probably we should probably be doing something about this there is just a tightness to the storytelling here. Like, you reminding me of that detail is like that, like, the setup is also that unit are all kind of off duty for the night. Yeah. And they don't think anything bad is going to happen. And the doctor is the only one with an inkling that something might go wrong. This is basically like these, five, and I know we said this about Tomb of the Cybermen, but I feel it like even stronger about this one. You could edit these five episodes into a movie and it would just feel like a great action movie. Yeah. And not even like a low budget 70s like sci fi movie, just it's an action movie. It's basically Die Hard. It's, sure, yeah. It's, it, but with, like, the doctor in that role of being stuck in this thing he doesn't expect to be stuck in, and it's all of the, you know, the cops, in this case unit, trying to figure out how to get in or out to help, and all this stuff going on. And it really just does have that kind of propulsive quality where everything is, all the pieces are put into place so that when shit goes wrong, everything is, like, milked for maximum dramatic potential. Like, yeah. you know, this is not the deepest Doctor Who story. It doesn't have, like, a bunch of, like, you know, deep thematic philosophical things going on, I don't think, necessarily. But, like, it is so good at what it sets out to do in just basic action, like, momentum-driven storytelling. Its surfaces are better than most stories' depths. Yeah. So, so like, building that momentum and setting some stuff up is that uh, Sergeant Bitten and Captain Mike Yates yeah. surveil the scene the next morning in, in a helicopter, which that helicopter comes up a tough couple of times. They have a lot of fun with that helicopter. Because it's not every day that classic Doctor Who gets to use the helicopter. <laughs> no. So they really use the shit out of this one. Um, but they also, it's, there's this great, like, helicopter shot of them flying over and, and looking down and seeing there's these gigantic footprints uh, like in the ground in this like around the small English village that's almost like the the bad Godzilla movie like it's sort of like the shots reminded me of that of these giant footprints setting up a Zal that we don't like really get as an active presence in the story until the last couple of episodes but yeah so they sort of set up that and it's just in more sort of building that tension building the sense of like there's something like unusually big going on here for a Doctor Who story it's like this giant monster that is somewhere out here and this is also sort of where we get what we talked about with Sergeant Ben and, and Miss Hawthorne teaming up and, and suggesting this slight romance between them that I wish went somewhere like I wish I like there has got to be some weird like Doctor Who magazine comic or big finish audio story that is about like the married life of Sergeant Bend and Miss Hawthorne together after the, like ten years after the story took place. Oh, and I, I seriously doubt there's anything in the rest of classic Doctor Who that would prevent you from having that be your head canon. Sure, yeah, but that's who he goes home to. I mean, that's it's got to be. They have such a good relationship because Miss Hawthorne is so weird and crazy, and you know Sergeant Bend is so like down to earth and stable. They. they they, they bounce each other. Well. Miss Hawthorne is one of the most unique versions of this like archetypal character I've ever seen in that she's never the really the butt of the joke. Uh -huh. She's usually in on the joke. She knows people think she's weird. At some point I think she even knows she's wrong about this specific incident and she doesn't care. She just does she does her. And yeah, it's like great. that's it's the thing with Miss Hawthorne that I really like about her character is that she obviously most of the town thinks that she's like the crazy mad woman that lives like on the hill or something and she's Fully cognizant of that, is 100% aware, is in no way ignorant that that is how she's perceived, but she doesn't give a fuck because, like, she's trying to help people. She's a white witch. She's trying to save lives here. And yeah. so she's going to do whatever it takes to do that. Um, yeah, and I, I really like that 
small detail of her character that yeah. she carries herself with pride. So in the second slash third episode is also where we start learning about the heat shield around this, the town. Yeah. This is one of my favorite details because it provides a lot of the action is that kind of the ticking clock in this one is can unit and, and the brigadier get through the heat shield in time to help the doctor. Yeah. And the doctor has these wonderful interactions with a unit scientist who is not very good at his job. Who is named Osgood. Which is real. I, I, that was interesting. Yeah. Given that I had forgotten that that was a reference to a small... Yeah. I mean, he's only in this story, so... Yes. He's not, Osgood's not around a lot, but... Well, I was actually meant to ask you that. Is, is Osgood a bigger thing? Because they went so far as to name a character after him later. No, but no. I think probably Steve Moffat just thought it was a good name. It was yeah. like, well, it makes a good, decent little weird reference to. Yeah, no, totally. He, that's one of Stephen Moffat's favorite things to do. Yeah. <laughs> His little weird references. But yes. Um, no, yeah, you have Osgood and them trying to get through. But I think the whole idea, because it's... This great idea where it obviously doesn't take a lot of money to realize that idea. You just have to, like, light things on fire at opportune moments. But it really does give this sense of, like, there's a physicality to it. Almost like today the thing would be, like, there's a dome around the city. Right. Like Stephen King style. But they don't need that because it's just the idea of this heat shield. And that's just a great... And it leads to so many cool things over the course of the episode. And I think a pretty legitimately impressive special effect when they get through it. And there's, like, this kind of... Tunnel ring they can go through. I don't. I don't know how they pulled that off. I can t- actually tell you how they pulled that off because there was a small, like I guess, like an hour long sort of like documentary thing they made for. I think it was like originally a VHS release. You can find it online. Uh, it was. It's John Pertwee, Nicholas Court- Courtney, uh, the actress who play Captain Mike Yates and uh, Sergeant Benton, the, the director for this episode. I actually, should find his name because he's very good. And the, the director also has directed a number of different. Uh, Doctor Who stories that we maybe will see another episode from him sometime in the near future is uh, Christopher Barry. Right. And so for this uh, feature called, I think, At Devil's End, they, there's a lot of, they, they kind of, Nicholas Briggs takes them up to this town and like sort of like is interviewing them and talking to them about all this stuff and sort of like reminiscing about this story. Um, and then Christopher Barry talks about that special effect. What they did was they sort of made this like little like arc thing and put um, this like glimmery sort of like Christmas glitter stuff on it and then put the camera behind a plastic like glass sheet and put Vaseline on that sheet around where you would see through to this like weird little arc they made with the glittery stuff on it and so shot it through that with that Vaseline to make it look very like vague and kind of sparkly see this is why CGI is destroying us you don't have to get this creative there's yeah. just I love that I love that someone figured that out because it's it is like it is 100 percent an impressive special yeah. effect. I think everything around the special effects with the heat shield are like some of them are not as like sort of like creative like technically creative as that specific one, but they're all really effective. Oh, totally. And it lends that side because that's also that's the sort of the brigadier side of the story is him, you know, because again he he was out of town. I think the implication was like he was basically on a date or something. Um, and then he gets, he's trying to figure out what happens, finds out that Sergeant Ben and Mike Gates have taken his helicopter and are flying around. And he's like, okay, I need to figure out what the fuck's going on here. And goes up to where the seat shielded thing is, where also this is where we get one of the first explosions in the demons is some random like delivery dude or something like accident like is driving into the heat shield and gets out of his car for some reason and the car just fucking explodes which is very good like they also in addition to getting their hands on a helicopter they got their hands on some dynamite and they yeah. had a lot of fun with it it was just like this is, it was left over from some like movie production or something so like well let's just blow up this fucking truck um so yeah so anyways I, I the heat shield thing I think is a really good combination of one like just having like them like spread all this like this big line of like soot or black mm-hmm. like dust whatever it is that they put down there to make it look like this is like this impassable area the sea shield they have this like sound effect that goes along with it that kind of like sounds like rushing wind and then they just really love sticking shit into the heat shield and having it explode and then also and they kind of use that effect again to uh, demonstrate box powers when they're like throw a rock at him and they have it blow up the rock blow up in midair and like kind of vaporize and it's it's a really simple effect, but it's particularly that first time they do it when when the brigadier like cautiously cautiously steps up to the heat shield and takes out his like riding crop thingy and sticks it in there, and the end of it just bursts into flames. And it's one of those things of like you know they actually just like burst the end of that thing into flames while Nicholas Cordy was holding it, so you can see the expression on his face is like holy shit! Like the, you don't even need to act for that one because it's got to be surprising when anything you're holding just explodes into flames in your hand. Uh, like it, and every time they're like they throw rocks, they throw sticks, they throw all this shit, and just blow it up when it goes through the heat shield. And it's a really simple but very convincing effect of you do not want to pass through this big black zone because you will fucking die. Yeah, and it's just again in that kind of diehard way, it adds so much like 
immediate tension to so many things because there is this kind of ticking clock. Will they be able to get through that heat shield? Yeah. In time. Yeah. yeah. And of course, we talked about the car chase. The car chase is amazing. Yeah, it's just, again, they get to make very good use of this helicopter by having the helicopter swooping down on the doctor and while he's driving um, with Bessie. And then they make use of the stock footage for of the helicopter blowing up. So you get another giant explosion. <laughs> Which, I will good. say, it's all well integrated. If I had not read that, I wouldn't have. Yeah, read, me neither. Like, I, I think I could have guessed that, like, they probably didn't do that because I think, like, right. that would have been very hard, like... For classic Doctor Who to do, like even like on miniatures, that wouldn't right. be easy to do. Uh, so, but yes, but it's a very good effect. It's just a good like ramping up. It's also a nice reminder that like James Bond was relatively fresh enough at the time that they could license footage from it. Exactly, you could never do that today. Yeah, and that would be pretty amazing if like fucking for the Christmas special, Stephen Moffat got fucking stock footage from Skyfall. <laughs> yes, that'd be. I don't know where it would even go, yeah. but they do it like the house blowing up at the end. Exactly, yeah. yeah. But but that also that sequence leads to another detail I really like is that um, for a lot of this episode, uh, Captain Mike Yates has been driving around on this motorcycle, and that's he's on that motorcycle right? during this hot helicopter chase where he's sort of futilely shooting his pistol at it, and then um, after that, um, I forget like the whole sequence of why the doctor transfers over, but the, but then the doctor. Is like here. Let me take this motorcycle. Gets on the motorcycle, and this is a thing that you might not know about. Like John Pertwee was that he was a total motorhead. I think it's one of the reasons why he liked all having all these weird vehicles. He also was a big fan of motorbikes. Of course, and so he was. He gets on like fucking John Pertwee gets on this motorbike and just revs the thing up and drives off. It's like it's that just, is a man who was made to be on a fucking motorcycle. It's amazing because I don't think we've had another Doctor Who actor. Who has been that confident getting on a motorbike? Yeah, it's just it is something. His costume is so perfect to it too, because he's got the whole cloak that is like flapping in the winds. Uh, it's another on that at Devil's End mini documentary. There's a funny little thing that they talk about that apparently uh, John Pertwee and the director Christopher Barry were having an argument the day that they were filming all the the motorcycle stuff, and John Pertwee kind of got bored with filming, so he just drove off and went for a small Sunday ride. That's the around most... the English countryside on this motorcycle. He just was the third Doctor. That's exactly what the third Doctor would do. Uh-huh. It's very funny. It's a really good mental <laughs> image of just be like, I'm just gonna. Okay, that's a good enough segue. Sean, why is John Pertwee an amazing doctor? Oh man, I mean, there's so there's so much he brought to the role. I think like, and one of the big things is this this transition to this like really competent, like powerful leading man figure that the doctor sort of never really was before this point that the first doctor definitely has this like confidence but he's also old and kind of frail in that way that like he's not physically imposing all the time and then the second doctor is so sort of like bouncing around the edges of all these confrontations trying to sort of push things because he's also not like physically powerful whereas like john pertwee has this like intense charisma and physical presence on screen he was this like really tall like fit guy he was also in the military he was in the navy um, so like he has that whole presence. Although one of the fun thing, funny things about it is that he was really famous before Doctor Who for playing the main character in Wurzel Gummidge, which was a children's comedy program where he played this like sentient scarecrow kind of character. So he was known for being a comedian. Um, and sort of like a comic actor before this point, but he just like comes on the screen immediately as the third doctor, totally commanding, takes control of every single like moment that he's on screen, utterly commands his screen presence constantly, and also just has this really fun, interesting interpretation of the character, which is leaning more into this like, I know best, I am, I am smarter than all of you, I know everything about all this shit, like I'm a man of science. And, and they give John Pertwee a lot of gobbledygook to say in all these stories. He gave, another reason why the Demons is a great one to pick for John Pertwee is that he does tell Osgood to reverse the polarity flow. It's like, what? What the fuck are you talking about? Um, but it is the... the it, it, it's, he's got that commanding presence on screen, but then also is able to be very warm. Um, and that's one of the things I like about his relationship with his like main companions in particular is he has that kind of like father daughter relationship with them and is this very warm like kind figure. And you feel it is one thing I feel like um, I think this is something that Peter Capaldi said in an interview um, is that whenever he was on screen, you felt utterly safe. Like oh, like he's yeah. just something that you know he's going to take care of this. Then you are utterly safe with him one hundred percent of the time. I love that description. I mean, I 
I love pretty much anything Peter Capaldi says about Doctor Who because yeah. few people are more of an authority, <laughs> you know, yeah. especially now having played the Doctor for four years. But it's yeah, I, I agree. All of that, absolutely. And beyond that, like one of the things that's so fun about this era is that I think the stories and the the status quo are all written so well to John Pertwee's strengths. In that, you know, putting the Doctor in this scenario where he is trapped on Earth brings out both the the best in the Doctor and sometimes the most petty because his like singular goal is to get away from these stupid humans. Yeah, and he like. It kind of brings out the, the snob in him and that he just wants, because he cannot go out and, like, save the universe willy-nilly, he has to get, like, love and affection from all these people around him. And so he has, he's a show-off. Yeah. And he's kind of a, a prick about it, you know? But a, such a lovable one. Like, he never means ill. He's just kind of smug. And, you know, he's earned it. He's an immortal Time Lord. He's earned it a little bit. But that's so fun. And I, and I think it leads to... Some interesting stories also about his ego, and, and the demons isn't quite one of those, but I think there are other ones in the run. Like Inferno is completely, the Doctor goes too far and makes yeah. a huge mistake with his TARDIS, and he's too eager to get away, and he nearly like, I mean, he winds up saving the Earth, but a lot of stuff goes wrong before the end, and it's about him kind of overcoming that. And I do think they allow the Doctor to have all these different interesting kind of shadings and character flaws that make him really interesting but it does come back to me to that that warmth and intelligence. And I love that Peter Capaldi description that you always feel safe when he's on screen. There's just... I could watch John Pertwee's Doctor read the phone book. He uh-huh. is so entertaining all of the time. He is such a confident, commanding, warm, wonderful presence. Um, you know, I've said this before, and like really watching through it in order solidifies it for me. He's my favorite Doctor, him or probably Peter Capaldi. Um, which I know is weird because he's still technically the Doctor, but I can say that he's really good. Sure, yeah. But like you know, those are kind of the two. If I pick one classic and one modern, is what I was going to say. Those are kind of the two that come to mind for me. And just again, that that's why I wanted to watch this run. Is every time I'd watch a John Pertwee story, it was like I need to see more of this. And it is something where when you watch it in order, you just get so much more of what that performance is, and and how much there is, I think, going on in it. He's Wonderful, and, and it also like I love the detail that he was a comedian before he was the Doctor yeah. because it's a, it's it's not like an overtly comic performance all the time, but I do think you get you get this a lot when comedians go dramatic is that they're able to bring frankly even more shadings than a dramatic actor would be able to find some yeah. of the time, you know. And it's interesting because we have not had like a straight comedian play the Doctor in the modern era. Many of them are very funny, but this is kind of a unique thing. Yeah. Another because, element of the third Doctor that I love is the costume. Oh, the is so, so good. Because this is the, also the first time the show goes for a more outlandish costume. Because for the first Doctor and the second Doctor, it's just kind of like fairly normal, like dressed up uh, men's clothes that have like a little bit of eccentricity to it, but not a whole lot. Whereas like the third Doctor just goes all the fucking way with it. And man, does John Pertwee look really fucking amazing in those outfits. Oh, he looks amazing. Like, and it's, it's a great, like, revolving door of costumes, too. Yeah. Because he's got the same kind of undershirt with, like, all the frills and everything that looks like he's from an 1800s wig party or something. But, like, the outer coat has, is, there's different colors. Like, in this one, in episode three, he has this red one that is fucking awesome. Yeah. Maybe kind of reminded me of uh, the Twelfth Doctor. I think it's in Pyramid at the End of the World. He has that red coat. Sure, yeah. It yeah. really feels like a John Pertwee costume. Yeah. Like, get there but like and he has like the color under like the cape he wears and everything like uh, obviously so much of it was built around doctor who's in color now let's use like and actually it's something i think is actually very impressive on a production standpoint in the john Pertwee years is that they didn't just switch to color and not think about it they find a lot of creative ways to use color in the stories like the yeah. Damons is one that yeah, i can't imagine in black and white oh yeah just like yeah. tomb of the cybermen i can't imagine in color this is one i can't imagine without the color it's so vibrant and important to everything that happens and yeah i just i always love when he gets a new color for the for the coat it looks so cool yeah i was uh, uh, john Pertwee in a, like an interview that he gave back when he was doctor who talked about with like because he obviously had a lot of input into the costume and he said one of the reasons why he liked the cloak is that for him symbolically it was like the wings of a mother hen that it is like that he would he would drape around someone to like protect them which is very much how he kind of uses it uh yeah it's a great he does do that and you know he has this you know the physicality he has with people like with with joe grant especially you probably wouldn't do that with a doctor today where he's frequently like, you know, putting an arm around her, kissing her forehead or something. It doesn't play weird to me though. No, like, yeah. in, in, cause so, I mean, it is so father daughter. This is so far before the doctor who had an inkling of, we're going to give the doctor a young woman to fuck. In space, right. yes, you know, yeah. like that's not the story. And it is just this affectionate, you know, fatherly grandfatherly kind of thing. 
And uh, it's just, it's sweet more than anything. He's yeah. a very, he, he likes to hide it, I think, under a lot of maybe, not bluster, but again, pride. Yeah. But he does care very deeply, I think, about the people around him. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Which is so much fun. Like, again, one of the reasons I would recommend the story right before this colony in space, which I think is a little underknown, is there's a lot of good... That's the first one where he gets to go into space in the TARDIS. Yeah. And Joe Grant as well. And you get to see, like, a different side of the Third Doctor where, like, he's not in active control of the situation all the time. And and kind of how he reacts to some of those things. Because it's kind of the first time he has to truly panic about a companion, I feel like. Right. Anyway. Um, but that leads me into episode four. Yes. Which is where... The doctor, uh, the master's minions, who are the people in the town who have been kind of hypnotized, brainwashed by... Because we forgot to say the master is a master of hypnosis also. Yes, exactly. Is, is, because this, again, this is when they start playing around with this idea that Time Lords have, like, latent, small psychic abilities. And yes. that, that the doctor just tends to not use them, but the master has no qualms in trying to mentally dominate people. Yep, and he has mentally dominated the people of this town. Although it's never clear if he literally hypnotized them or just he gave some really yeah. impressive speeches. I mean, you do have that really fantastic scene where he's like holding this sort of like small yes. town hall and, and just telling all these people like, like, you can have everything you want. All you have to do is obey me and then like eventually like the townspeople are like no we're not it's like you fools you think you're going to rule the world i'm going to rule the world and it's like and he's just like he drops all the pretense he's just like no you're just going to obey me like he stops trying to just convince them he's like you primitives fuck off no it's, every scene with the master in this story is solid gold yeah but you get this one where the the people in the town have decided the ma- the doctor is a wizard and, or a dark, you know, witch yeah. and has to be burned. So they tie him to the maypole, which they have been dancing around, and are starting to burn him. And Miss Hawthorne comes out and convinces them that the doctor is a great, like, white wizard named Quee Quai Quad. Yeah. Well, you've missed, like, the, the, the build-up to that scene is also fucking perfect. Because, like, uh, Sergeant Benton and, and Miss Hawthorne are, like, hiding in the, uh, the, the bar, basically, at the right. tavern. And the doctor has just gone off and sort of, like, helped the brigadier set up all his right. stuff with Osgood. Um, so he's on the way back from that and is walking up across this sort of, like, this, this village green area in the middle of the village where all the people are now holding this, this May Day festival where they're running around the maypole with the thing. And there's the one dude with the whole weird, like, leaf get up or whatever it is. And so the doctor's walking up to the tavern. Sergeant Ben sees him and is like, look, it's the doctor. And then while the doctor's coming up, all the people dancing around the maypole, like, get in front of him and are kind of like pushing him into the middle and then eventually they just surround him and Sergeant and it's a cut to Sergeant Ben he says that doesn't look right <laughs> and then yep. you just see the dude with the weird outfit you find out it's like the main cultist guy pulls a fucking gun on him and then they tie him around the maypole yep. it's like such an absurd sequence of events but it's very good it's so good and again it's like they know John Pertwee can very nimbly move between the action, the drama, and the comedy. Yeah. And his, like, reactions through this are so great. And then it's Miss Hawthorne to save the day. And I love that the Doctor has to basically realize, oh, shit, she has a really good idea here. I have to play along with this. And yeah. it's so funny. Yeah. Because the, he, he has, he's like, I, you know, I will do miracles. Look at that light. I will explode it. And it explodes. I command you, Lamp. Explode! And then Sergeant Benton with a silenced pistol shoots the lamp and everyone goes, Oh! Maybe Sergeant Benton's best contribution to this is that he just, he's in on it too. Like, he just figures out, like, yep, that's what I'll do. Yeah. And it's great. Like, I love that the Doctor has enough of a working relationship with these people that they're in on ludicrous plans like this. Yeah. And he blows, and he hits, like, this this rooster thing. The on weather the, vane. Yeah, the weather yeah. vane. And then it's, car, move! You come and, to me! And Bessie moves. And it's great. And because that's where the... Because when he gets Bessie to move, that's when the cultist dude is just like, No! Because everyone else has been convinced by this lamp exploding and the fucking weather vane turning. Which is also, by the way, like, weather vanes are supposed to fucking turn. <laughs> like, yeah, it's impressive that it turned right around the time that he said, Weather vane, move! But also that just means the wind blew. Like, it's not the most amazing miracle ever committed, you know, by man. Um, but all these villagers are like... He's real. It's quite quiet quiet or whatever. And then this one guy's like, no, don't listen to him. He's lying to you. And then then the doctor says, well, fine. If you don't believe me, look behind you. He says, I'm not going to listen to you. The traitor says, 
car, I command you, come to me. And so that Bessie very slowly turns and pulls up, and the guy pulling the gun refuses to look behind him because he thinks he's going to be tricked. And so Bessie just very slowly pushes him over and he falls on the ground. It's such a great sight gag. I mean, it really is like something out of a Herbie movie. Yeah. It's very good. And then when that guy, another thing I really love is when that guy gets up and he's trying to escape, Sergeant Benton runs out, like jumps off of the side of Bessie and tackles the guy to the ground, which is a great little stunt that he pulls. That's again, because another element of Sergeant Benton that I think one of the reasons why I really love his presence in this story is that he's not in uniform. He's just wearing this really dope leather jacket and like jeans. And so it's Sergeant Benton off duty. It's it's like if you had a Sergeant Benton movie where like he had to like you know he went so off the rails that he had to turn in his gun and his badge and but he's still going after the guy. That's what he looks like. What are the chances that's a big finish story that exists right now? I really hope it does. I'll have to go look for that on their website. But there's a non-zero chance. That that is- I mean, he has been in big finish stories, so there's actually a non-zero chance that they have just full on done that. Um, but yeah, he, that little thing where he just, it's that little detail where he jumps off of Bessie to get that like extra momentum to tackle the guy to the ground. And then we reach the, the climax of the story where Joe Grant has, there's this whole thing where Joe Grant gets like knocked out and all this stuff happens. And then yeah, Captain she, like, Mike Gates is trying to save her, but yeah. can't. And he, she wakes up and decides she's going to go try to stop all this. It's almost like she's possessed or something. Yeah. We don't get a like clear explanation for it, but it's cool. And then she and Mike Yates are in the the temple where the Master is doing his third summoning of Azal. And we haven't even talked about all the Master scenes yeah. yet. But like this whole... because As his plan comes into being, he wants Azal to grant him his power. And the Master keeps... that like Azal will be summoned three times, and on the third time he will make his choice. And so the Master keeps doing these rituals and... I mean, are there many Doctor Who moments better than Roger Delgado as the master speaking in satanic tongues on an altar? It's and with the robe. Like the robe oh. is so good. And then later in like the third summoning, he has like this like sacrificial knife thing that he pulls out to you. And it's just again, Roger Delgado has the perfect fucking look. It's like so- either for the master or for like the head of a satanic cult. Turns out that those are pretty equivalent character roles. And I just love like you get because he always has like more you know satanic gobbledygook to say. And it's like the master did his homework. Like yeah. he really got into this. He got the clothes. He got the knife. You kind of do get a feeling once in a while that the master just he likes to play the villain, like play yeah. dress up and like do something like this. And you get that here. And he's pulling heavily from his goth phase back yes. on Gallifrey. Yes. And uh, but yeah, we get the third summoning of Azal. He's going to sacrifice. Joe Joe Grant to the demon god, the doctor. There's so much good action in the last episode where yeah. they are able to get through the heat shield, but then like the device breaks down on the way through, and so the doctor isn't able to stop Bach, so he has to run around Bach the goblin demon thing, or the, the gargoyle. Yeah. And do- the doctor gets in there fully expecting that he might get killed by this thing. And you have this final standoff where the master, Azal, and the doctor are all shouting, and yeah. it's just it's it's just it's like thunderous it's wonderful yeah and you get this really great line where the master is like this stuff is like no like let me like i will have the power and i will rule these people and then it's like you know i'm i'm the one who's fit to rule all these people and then the doctor just sort of says off to the side to joe i think i've heard someone talk like that before i think it was hitler or was it genghis khan which is a really good little it's a very john pertwee line oh Uh, so good yeah and then uh I mean, there's so much good stuff that happens in this scene. I love that Azal just completely friend zones the master and, yeah. and is like, I will give my power, but not, not to you. you. And he decides to go to the doctor. The doctor rejects it. And then uh, what saves the day is Joe Grant and the power of love. Exactly. Yes. She, she jumps in front of the doctor and says, no, he's a good, kind man. And it's like, you can't kill him. And then Azal can't understand like the 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 contradiction of how illogical and insane this choice is because also azal there's there's all this stuff about how he is summoned through like negative emotions and all this stuff and that the ritual is done you know to sort of generate these negative emotions and then have some quality that can like controls an azal in some way it's a lot of like weird stuff but i really like the little like the detail they try to give it um and so yeah i think that is the one area of the episode that feels slightly weak is that like how they defeat Azal at the end is like, eh, you just had to do something to get rid of him. 
But what makes up for it is the whole action sequence that is happening outside while the Doctor is doing all this is that unit has come all the way through and they are like posted up outside this church where Bach, Bach the like invincible gargoyle who's powered by the magic of Azol, or I'm sorry, the science of Azol, I should say, um, is standing in front of like this gate. And so all the unit people are standing there and, and they're trying to shoot him and doesn't do anything. This is where the Brigadier rolls up and finally like the brigadier is able to sort of like be in the episode with the rest of the people and kind of like finally be able to crack this problem and, and so i think he's like talking to, to sergeant benton it's like he can't it's that buck They're like we can't get that guy it's like well i'll have him soon sorted jenkins chap with the wings five rounds rapid and and a legend was born and i cheered Grabbed the remote, rewound, and watched it like three more times. Yeah. Because that is one of the more infamous Doctor Who lines. So much so that Nicholas Courtney wrote, titled his memoir, Five Rounds Rapid. Yeah. It's so tied to him. Yeah, chap with the wings there. Yeah, chap. Five Rounds Rapid. It's, it's, it is an all-time moment. It's a fantastic line. Unfortunately, shooting Bach um, five times with an assault rifle doesn't really do much to him. So they have this whole huge standoff where they're like, like they just have all these extras playing unit dudes that are just like hiding behind like gravestones, shooting at Bach. And then eventually, I think Captain Mike Kate says something that's like, it's like shooting four-inch armor plating with a pea shooter. Benton, go get that bazooka over there. And, baz- and fucking Benton goes, gets a bazooka, comes over with this fucking bazooka, which is the most amazing thing in the world to see in Doctor Who. And Benton shoots fucking Bach with his bazooka, and Bach explodes all over the place. Eventually, he reforms. I'd like in this, what is also, I think, a pretty good special effect of Bach coming back together. So they just rewind the footage, but it yeah. looks really cool. It looks, it's like, it's very, it's a very good look. Um, yeah. But just. The image of fucking Sergeant Ben walking up with a fucking rocket launcher and firing it is so amazing. That is, again, like the fifth giant explosion we've had in this episode. That it's not even the last one yet. And it all comes together so great. Because I know the Joe Grant Power of Love thing is a deus ex machina, but it's also like... Like, with who those characters are and everything that's happened, it just works for me. Yeah. Like, you just go with it. I think it also, it definitely, like, works even better in context with, like, the rest of the season when, like, you've yeah. been building up these relationships. Absolutely. And you get that, and then that allows them to blow up Bach for good. Yeah. And just everything, like, it all comes together, and you just want to cheer. And they go outside, and they decide, you know, maybe there is some magic in the world, and dance around the maypole together. And not just Joe. Oh, no. John Perwey. Of course he joins in. Yes. But before that, we have to talk about the biggest explosion. I mean, we can sort of talk about right, a right, 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 right. where the church yeah. explodes. But one of my favorite parts is before the church explodes is everybody is running out. And I love that like because everyone's like, oh, God, this thing is going to explode. It's all the cultists and the unit people and the doctor and Joe and the master are all just mixed in together. And they're all just running for their fucking lives. And there's this great little sort of like gaff that happens. But it's like a really good like it works because the the two extras pull it off is that one of them one of the cultists that are running out of the church trips over another one and falls on the ground and has to scramble to get back up it's a really it's very funny but it works really well yeah no it gives the right kind of like chaos yeah just, as in like the church explosion is legitimately impressive like that's good miniature work it's yeah. awesome this great big you know what is a great action story without a final explosion to punctuate things and then they capture the master the master gets away in Bessie, and then the doctor says, they're like, oh, we've lost the master again. Not so fast. And he pulls out his little remote control and brings Bessie back, and you see the master like, oh, fuck. I also love the way that the master is, because they've captured the master, and, like, Sergeant Benton has him at gunpoint, and the master just flips his cloak over Sergeant Benton, and Sergeant Benton just collapses to the ground like he's like a newborn fawn or something. He can't stand up when he can't see. <laughs> so then the master runs away and gets in Bessie. <laughs> it's, it's just... It's such a perfect ending, as you say, not just this story, but this whole season, because it does feel like a lot is kind of converging here. Not not as much as we would say in like a modern setting, yeah. but like certainly for this, it's, it feels actually very progressive as a piece of storytelling yeah. for TV at the time. And yeah, and then we get the Maypole dance, and uh, I just, I wanted to stand up and cheer. This is a hell of a story. It's really fucking good. I mean, uh, so John Pertwee on multiple occasions called this his favorite Doctor Who story. Yeah. Uh, the director of this episode, who went on to direct a lot more Doctor Who, always said this was his favorite. I think multiple people on the production staff would say that. It's often cited as one of the great Doctor Who stories. And, you know, people just... It is... It has a legacy. 
and it deserves every fucking inch of it. Yeah. I think I think there are maybe Doctor Who episodes as good as this one. I don't know if there's many that are better than this one. This is this is as yeah. good as it gets. This Especially is... like if you're looking for this sort of like exciting action yeah. kind of Doctor Who story, which isn't that common, but happens like it happens more frequently now. And it's one of the things that makes this story feel like almost weirdly like ahead of its time in a way I mean not ahead of its time in the way that it wasn't appreciated when it came out because it certainly was but in terms of like the kind of Doctor Who story it feels kind of like what Moffat liked to do a little bit with like particularly in the Matt Smith era of like you know like think of like the Pandora opens and the Big Bang of like, like yeah. really big spectacular like kind of action stories almost with a science fiction kind of like element or veneer to it and this really has that quality to it and it's, it's executed so phenomenally it's so good it's so, and that's, that's here's the thing though. I've watched two seasons of the Third Doctor. This is probably my favorite of the ones I've seen. But there is Inferno, yeah, and there no. is Spearhead from Space, yeah. and there's just there's so many good ones. It's hit after hit after hit, and I, I haven't even gotten to his first Dalek episode. That's true. I, I'm not sure if you're going to be super blown away by it, but... Okay. I've, I've read Dalek about the plot, episode. and it seems cool, so... I, I really like the Ogrons, and the okay. Ogrons are very cool. Yeah, um, just moving on a bit, I will say, I am going to continue with my third Doctor rewatch. I, depending on what you say the fourth Doctor story is, we'll, we'll decide if I have to skip ahead a little bit at okay. first. Um, but I am, I'm delayed a moment here because the service I've been using to watch Doctor Who is BritBox, right. which is a great service. There are some episodes they don't have the rights to. The next one after this, Day of the Daleks, they don't have. Oh, I don't possession. think they have many of the, Some of the Dalek episodes they don't have, and I don't know what the rights issues are for that. It might just be the BBC is like, they sell too many DVDs. So I did, I was able to find a DVD of this and, and get it. And as soon as that comes, I will resume my rewatch. Um, but I got that. And I did go ahead and find which other ones are missing. And it's really just the other Dalek one. All right. I've, so I've gotten a couple of those on DVD. Because here's this little life hack for Doctor Who fans. If you do want to collect any classic Who on DVD, do not buy the American versions. They're way overpriced. And most of them are out of print and had like very limited print runs here. The UK ones you can get super cheap on eBay and elsewhere. Like I was getting these for 10 bucks a pop. Which is kind of nothing for some of these. Yeah. And um, they're really cool. So just get a region free player and you're good to go. They're, they're yeah. all the same stuff. But yeah. Anyway. Um, BritBox is, I should say, as we're going through this, it's a really good service. It's like $6 a month. And if you want to watch Classic Who with us, all the ones Sean's been recommending are on there. Yeah. So that's really cool. It's a very easy way. To, it's like when we've talked about Classic Who in the past, there was no easy place to go point people to. Yeah. Like these stories. Because it was like it would sometimes jump around and like sometimes Netflix would have some... Hulu had some for a while. Amazon had some for a while, but like it was never stable yeah. in a streaming capacity, uh, which was always very frustrating. So, Sean, yes, we will next month resume and we will move on to the fourth Doctor, Tom Baker, who yeah. has by far the longest tenure of any Doctor. He does. So, what are our plans for next month? So, so what we're going to do? I also want to point out something of that I have decided we're going to do two fourth Doctor ones because his run is seven years long. <laughs> Which is, I mean, the, the John Pert, we had the second longest run with five years, which is already very long. But, like, seven years is long enough that I just could not pick one story that was like, this is the fourth Doctor. This is, like, the fourth Doctor story that represents his era. So we're going to split it in half. We're going to do a late era fourth Doctor one two months from now. But next month, I have deliberated significantly over which one to pick. Because I think, for me personally, the the first three seasons or so of the fourth doctor is maybe to me like the most creatively powerful section in the history of the show and there are a lot of really brilliant episodes to pull from i played with like maybe doing ark in space and it's like ark in space is really fucking good i've also seen ark in space like four times so i was like we're not going to do ark in space people should watch, watch ark in space but also i kind of jonathan i kind of want you to wait and see ark in space in context okay. on top of it because i think it's when you see that, like, go from Robot, which is fourth doc, which is Tom Baker's first story, to Ark in Space, it's a really interesting transition. Um, so we're not going to do Ark in Space, because I thought about that for a while. And I was like, well, maybe we'll do Pyramids of Mars. Pyramids of Mars is a really good story. And I was leaning on that one for a while. But then I was just like, you know what? In my heart of hearts, if I'm looking at these stories, and I obviously can't do Talons of Wang Cheyenne, because we've already done that. And even that's, like, not quite the gothic horror one I want, because this is the gothic horror era of Doctor Who. If I'm going with my gut, I have to do the story that is based on the best gothic horror novel that exists, Frankenstein. So we're going to do The Brain of Morbius okay. next month for the fourth Doctor. Unexpected left field choice. It's really fucking good. I'm really excited. Um, it is going to be our first story that is basically co-written by Robert Holmes, who is my favorite writer 
in, in the history of Doctor Who. It also, if you're a big fan of modern Doctor Who and you've always wondered where the fuck did all those weird old women in the red robes come from in the, the, the fucking Peter Capaldi stuff, well, now you're going to find out. Indeed. So next month, the bra- brain? The brains of-, of Morbius. It's very good. Will we have jelly beans? I think there might be a couple of jelly babies waiting for us. <laughs>